All right, here. Now, I read Genesis chapter number one. This is not going to be a, a sermon on creation, but a reason why we read Genesis chapter one is because there's, there's something that's repeated here very often that I want to uh, point out. And, and look at Genesis chapter 1, look at verse number 3, it says, And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And, and what I'm going to point out, you see this, as God is going through the creation, God says something, and it comes to pass. Now obviously it's amazing just in the fact that God could create everything just through His Word. But what I'm going to preach about this morning is being a man of your words. Amen. Okay, now we see here God, He says something, and it happens. That's right. God is is not a liar. God is God is the most faithful <laughs> being entity, you know, in, in, in the entire universe. When God says something, you know that it's true, and you know that it'll come to pass. That's right. And this is the, the type of person, these are the type of men, the type of people that we ought to be in our life. Is someone who could say something and it actually means something. You see, in our society today, this is this has been lost. Yes. Men used to be men of their words. When you would say something, if you would make a promise or you would make an oath or you say something, just because you said it, because it was your word, right. people would respect that and, and, and adhere to that and say, well, this person said thus and so. Yeah. And you're going to hold them to that. That's right. These days, you, you can't take practically anybody for their word anymore because there's so much lies. People are just so flippant about what comes out of their mouth. Right. And we'll just say whatever pops into their head, and and it's nonsense. And we have to be careful about this as Christians. Yes, sir. We need to make sure that we keep ourselves to a higher standard than the world. We need to make sure that we're keeping ourselves to God's standards. And it just, you know, all throughout Genesis one, you see, I mean, God says something, and it was so. God said, "Let there be light," and it was so, and it happens. And that's the way that we ought to live our life. We ought to have that type of integrity. We ought to have that type of of respect for, for what we say to just um, be able to be taken at our word. Now, God makes a lot of promises, and they're always fulfilled. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 6. Again, we're going to start off with God because when He says stuff, it comes to pass. And I'm just, we're just going to go over this briefly. He's the best example for us to follow. Hebrews chapter number 6. In verse number 16, the Bible reads, For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. So here's saying, this is just talking about men that swear. They swear by something greater than themselves. That's why a lot of people will say, I swear to God. Right? I mean, they're, they're swearing by something that's, that's greater than them. And it says it's an oath for confirmation to them, an end of all strife. It's something to end disagreements, ends fighting. Say, look, I swear, you know, I haven't done that. Or I swear that this is true. And this is what we use. And, and we have to be very careful with our oaths, vows, our swearings. We're, this is what this whole sermon is going to cover. This is a topic, is, is how we should be dealing with this. But first and foremost, if you do make an oath, if you do swear something, if you say something, you better make sure that you follow through with it or that what you're saying is true. Look at verse number 17. It says, Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, or two unchangeable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set, the, the hope set before us. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunners for, for us entered, even Jesus, made in high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. God confirmed, basically he confirmed the promise unto us by an oath. He confirmed our salvation by an oath. And by two immutable things, that it's impossible for God to lie. Right. God cannot lie. We can trust and take God at his word. It's impossible for him to lie to us. That's why we have an anchor for our soul. We can anchor our soul and just completely rest it on the shed blood of Jesus Christ because he came and paid for our sins. God promised to us eternal life. 
It's impossible for him to lie. He Amen. cannot go back on his word. When he makes a promise, it is true. And we can hold him to that so much that we can anchor our soul to that. Amen. That's right. We stake our entire salvation to what God has done for us, for what God has said that he has done for us. We didn't see Jesus Christ die on the cross 2,000 years ago. We didn't see this stuff happen, but we can believe God because God told us it happened. God told us about our salvation. God told us that this is what we have, that, that we can believe him. And we know that God is true. We know that he's not a liar. It's impossible for him to lie. This is how important, I mean, think about how important it is to be able to trust God's word. We, have, I mean, if you can't trust God's word, you can't trust anything. That's right. But we trust in God's word. We know God's word is true. We ought to be living to that type of an example so that someone can look at you and say, when you speak, when you say something, you know, obviously you're not God and I'm not even saying that, but that's the example. We ought to be able to, people ought to be able to listen to you and hear what you're saying and be able to believe you. That's right. You don't have some record of just going around and telling lies or spouting off your mouth or if you say you're going to do something, you just don't follow through and you don't do it. That is not the way that we all live because God never backs out. God always comes through with his promises. And when he says that, just a few verses, you don't have to turn there. Proverbs tells us how much God hates lying. And think about this. If you say something, be careful. If you say, oh, I don't lie. Because you might be thinking that you're not just intentionally saying something to somebody else to deceive them. But what about if you say, if I were to tell my wife, Leslie... In, in one hour, I'm going to fix the, you know, this, this kitchen appliance that's broken. That's, that's what I'm going to do in one hour from now. And then in two hours, I haven't done what I said. Mm -hmm. What does that make me? Mm -hmm. I lie. That's right. If I don't do, if I don't follow through and say what I was going to do. Now, people don't necessarily think about it that way. You think like, oh, well, I didn't, you know, like purposefully in my heart and, and if you know even if it's not my intention you know like I am intending to do this thus and so but be careful when you say you're going to do something and again don't just get flippant about it don't get relaxed about it because that's what happens that's what we do we just say oh yeah well it's not a big deal you know I got busy so what that's right well look if you're going to say something follow through with it you need right. to be a man of your word you want people to be able to hear what you have to say now look I'm guilty of this myself. Okay, I've done this. I've told lies. I'm not perfect. Okay, so I'm preaching at myself just as much as anybody else, but we all need to make sure that we're, that we're careful in the words that we use and when we're going to commit ourselves to do something or whatever it may be, when you speak, make sure that what you're saying is going to be true and that you can hold to that promise. This is what God feels about, about lying. Proverbs 6.16 says, These six things that the Lord hates. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he, excuse me, that soweth discord among brethren. Notice, of the seven things that God hates, two of them are lying. All right. Not even just one. He lists it twice. Yeah. Right. It's important. God wants us to be true to our word. He does not want you to be a liar. Proverbs 12, 22 says, Lying lips are abomination to the Lord. That's right. But they that deal truly are his delight. Amen. Abomination is, is, is a word that has a lot of weight to it. This is not a word that's, and again, in the Bible, it's not just lightly tossed around. Not everything is an abomination to God. Not every sin is an abomination to God. That's right. Okay? But lying lips are are an abomination to God. Keep that in mind. This is something that, that's very serious. Proverbs 13.5 says, A righteous man hateth lying, but a wicked man is loathsome and cometh to shame. We ought to hate lying. That's right. That's not, not just dislike. I mean, you ought to have hatred for lying and just, and just not accept it and not want to have that in your life. Ephesians chapter 4, it says, that you, verse 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. We all have the sinful flesh. This is something we have to do daily. We have to die daily. Put away the old man. The old man is going to be flipping by what he says. The old man isn't going to care about telling lies. The flesh isn't going to care about this. We have to put off the former conversation, the way we used to speak, the things that we used to say. Put it away and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. 
that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And then it says in verse 25, wherefore, put away lying. That's right. Putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Amen. We need to make sure that we are speaking the truth once another. And then later on in that chapter, it says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Right. When you tell lies, when you just, just let your conversation be in the flesh, that grieves the Holy Spirit. That's, right. that's going to grieve God. That's going to grieve His Holy Spirit. We need to make sure that we're diligent and that we're very careful and that you have a filter that goes through your mind when you're going to speak and when you're going to say something. Because our words are important. The Bible says that, it says in my notes, but, um, you know, that we're going to be, basically we're going to be judged off our words. Every vain word That's right. that, that, that men shall speak, you know, it's going to come back to you, okay? And, and don't just, just let your mouth run. Um, you know, a, a, the foolish man is known by as much speaking, the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And um, in abundance of words, there wanteth not sin. That's right. Now, if you would please turn to Deuteronomy chapter... No, turn to Judges 11. We're going to get there real quick. Leviticus 19 verse 11 says, You shall not steal, neither deal falsely, neither lie one to another, and you shall not swear by my name falsely. Neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. When you swear by God, when you swear by his name falsely, when you're saying false statements, you're profaning the name of God. I mean, you're, you're dragging God's name down. If you're going to make an oath and you're going to say, like, by God, or if you're going to make an oath to God, you dead sure better make sure you follow through on that oath. That Because now you're involving God. You're involving a holy God. You're involving a sinless God. Not only do you bring damage to yourself when you tell those lies, but if you're going to involve God, and if you're going to swear, and you're going to involve someone like that, and involve His name, well, when you lie, when you, when you, you end up profaning His name, you're dragging His name down with yours. That's right. And we ought to be careful about that and, and make sure that you are using... That filter and, and do not do not make these these oaths and these swearings lightly at all if you're going to do that. Deuteronomy 12, you're in Judges 11, we're we'll going to get to that in just a second because that's an example of a man that makes a foolish vow unto God. In Deuteronomy 23, I'll read this for you, verse 21 says, When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it. For the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it would be sin in thee. You say, if you make a vow to God, you better make sure you follow through. God's going to require it of you. God is paying attention. He doesn't think that those are just vain words. He's listening to what you say, and he's going to say, I'm requiring that of you. And God will hold you to it. He said it would be sin in thee, so if you don't do it, it's a sin. It says in verse uh, Deuteronomy 23, 22, But if thou shalt forbear to vow, it shall be no sin in thee. He said, if you don't vow, if you don't make that vow, then it's not a sin. I mean, if you don't follow through on something that you're not vowing, then it's never a sin in the first place. So be careful with what you're saying. It doesn't, you don't always have to make a vow, <laughs> right? If you want to do something, if you're serious about something, you don't always have to make a vow about it. You don't have to vow to God because if you don't follow through with it, that is sin. That's right. But if you never make the vow to begin with right. and you don't do it, that's, that's not a sin. That's what it's saying. It says, That which is gone out of thy lips, thou shalt keep and perform even a free will offering according as thou hast vowed unto the Lord thy God, which thou hast promised with thy mouth. Look at, we're in Judges chapter 11. Look at verse number 30. This is a story of Jephthah. Jephthah was one of the judges. And, um, you know, God had these great deliverers that he would send. He would use these men whenever the children of Israel were going through a hard time. Maybe they were being oppressed. You know, something was going on, he would send a deliverer. He would send one of these judges to help free them and, 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 to, and to bring them back to life. And um, Jephthah was one of these men. So here we see the, the children of Ammon is, is, is the, the nation that they're fighting with in this story. Look at verse number 30. It says, And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou shalt without fail 
deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So he's saying, look, God, if you're going to help me out here, we've got this battle. If you deliver them into my hands, if you, if you bring victory to us, he says, I promise when I go home in peace, when we're done with this war and I go home, the first thing that comes out to me, I'm going to offer that up as a burnt offering unto you, dear God, to show my thanks, to show my gratitude. That's, that, that was his vow. Now, he's thinking in his mind, you know, he had cattle, he had animals. He's thinking that when he goes home, the first thing he's, you know, that he's going to see is one of his livestock, one of his animals come out, and that's what he's going to offer up unto God. But let's see what happens. It says in verse 32, So Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hand. So God follows through. God does what he asked him to do. God answers his prayer. It says, And he smote them from a roar, even till thou come to Minnith, even twenty cities, and unto the plain of the vineyards, with a very great slaughter. Thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. And Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances, and she was his only child. Beside her he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me. For I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. And she said unto him, My father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth, for as much as the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even of the children of Ammon. Extremely sad story. This is, this is a horrible story. And it always, it's always troubling when I read this because, I mean, here's a man that what he ended up doing, he opened up his mouth foolishly unto God. He made a vow that he shouldn't have made. Now, did he have to make that God in order to make that, excuse me, did he have to make that vow in order for God to help him and to, to, to defeat the children of Ammon? No, he did not have to do that. He did not have to make that vow. He chose to make that vow. That's right. Okay, God could have helped him regardless of making that vow or not. If he could have just prayed and asked God and relied on God to help, history shows, the Bible shows that that's what he's looking for. He's not looking for you to make that specific vow in order for him to help you. But see, this is what happens, and this is what we have to be careful of. Okay, because oftentimes people will make vows to God when they're in trouble. There were hard times here. This was a big battle. This was a big deal. You know, this, he, was, he was the underdog in this fight. He needed God's help. So he decided to make this vow, to make this deal with God. And I know, I know even from personal experience, I've done this myself. Okay? When you get into trouble, when you're backslidden, you get into sin, and things are just real bad, you say, God! You know, in my case, it was, I got a, I got a DUI, so I, God, I promise I will never drink another drop of alcohol again. Now, thank God, I've, I've kept that vow to this day. But, when you open up your mouth to God, you better make sure that you keep up on that, on that promise. You better make sure that it says, if you're going to open up your mouth to God. And, and you know what Jephthah did? He still had respect unto, unto, unto God and, and to the importance of his word. And he put himself in a position. There was, that's a no-win situation. He had no, there was no good solution to his problem at that point, but he got himself into that mess. Mm -hmm. God didn't require him to make a vow like that. He opened up his mouth. And we need to look at this story, and we need to make sure that, that this sinks in, because the gravity of making a vow unto God is very important. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 5, verse 4, it says, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. The Bible is saying, you're a, if you vow a vow unto God and you don't pay it, you're a fool. You are a fool if you don't do that. It says, better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. So if you're going to make a vow, you better consider the cost. You better think that if you're going to make a vow, you're going to say something like Jeff that said, you better be willing to follow through with that vow and be able to pay that cost. Because he said, it's better just not to vow at all. To don't even do it. Don't even get involved in those vows. 
if you're not going to be able to pay it. It says, Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Your words can get your flesh into trouble. Your words, the words that you say, can cause you to sin. I mean, should, was it right for Jephthah to offer up his daughter as a burnt sacrifice unto the Lord? No. Absolutely not. Of course not. We don't believe in human sacrifice. God's not a God that demands human sacrifice of us. That was wrong. But he got himself into the situation where it's a sin either way. Through his mouth. I mean, <laughs> and, and, and he decided that, you know what? I'm not going to break my vow into God. And, um, and, and it's also, just be careful with what you do. This is a sermon, a, service, a sermon about just warning us to pay attention to the words that we speak and the vows that we make and that we ought to be able to live in a way that people can hear what you say and believe you and trust and have faith in you that whatever it is that you say you're going to do, you're going to do it. You're going to follow through and do it. It says, turn to Numbers chapter 30 if you would, because now this is going to get into a little bit that's, this is something that's been lost, and I don't know, it's not preached on very often at all. We're talking about vowing vows. There's some rules laid out here on vows and, 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 lay, and, um, and just guidelines and rules that God has laid out for, for giving vows. We're going to look through Numbers chapter 30. <coughs> and you're going to find that a lot of traditions that maybe you didn't understand today, we're going to get to that in a minute, they come from somewhere, they come from the Bible oftentimes, but they just get so far removed from the Scripture that you just look at something and be like, why, does that, why do we even do that? Why, like, how did that ever even come into being? Numbers chapter 30, when we look at this, look at verse number 1, it says, And Moses spake unto the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded if a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. He's saying, look, again, just, as, just a review of everything else that we've just covered. If you make a vow, you have to do everything that comes out of your mouth. You need to perform it. Now we're going to get into some rules actually involving women in making vows. Because it's different than with a man. If you're a daughter or if you're a wife, there are specific rules that are, that, are, that are applied to making a vow. Look at verse number three. It says, If a woman also vow a vow unto the Lord and bind herself by a bond, being in her father's house in her youth. So here's a daughter, right? She wants to vow a vow unto God. It says, And her father hear her vow and her bond wherewith she hath bound her soul. And her father shall hold his peace at her. That means he doesn't say anything. He hears what she says, but he decides, you know, I'm going to hold my peace. That means you don't, you don't say anything at all. Then all her vows shall stand, and every bond wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand. So it's saying, look, That's right. if dad hears the vow, and he's okay with it, he doesn't say anything, then that vow stands. The vow that she made unto God, hey, she's going to be held responsible for that vow, and she better follow through and do that what she says. But it says in verse 5, but if her father disallow her in the day that he heareth, not any of her vows or of her bonds wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand. And the Lord shall forgive her because her father disallowed her. So if dad says, no, you are not making that vow, then God looks at that. He sees that. He says, okay, well, you're forgiven. You're not held to that bond. You're not held to that vow because dad said, no, this is the authority that God has given to the father in the household. And this is something that, that, I mean, the world today would look at that and be like, <gasps> But women and men are equal. What do you mean that the father can say, you know, what about the son? Well, what if the son makes about, can the dad, you know, and, and this is the nonsense that we hear today. But look, this is the Bible, my friend. This is what God made as the rules. And it does not put any less importance or any less value on the woman. But this is the way that God established it. This is the way that God establishes authority in the household and, and if the father hears something the daughter says, he can disallow that vow. And that vow is null and void. Look at verse number six. It says, And if she had it all husband, when she vowed or uttered aught out of her lips, where was she bound her soul? And her husband heard it and held his peace at her in the day that he heard it, 
Then her vows shall stand, and her bonds wherewith she bound her soul shall stand. But if her husband disallowed her on the day that he heard it, then he shall make her vow which she vowed, and that which she uttered with her lips, wherewith she bound her soul, none effect, and the Lord shall forgive her. It's the same way with the husband as it is with the daughter. So the father can disallow the, the, the daughter's vows. This, the husband can do the exact same thing. You can say, well, she's an adult. She can do it. No. God looks at it and says, no. The authority in the household is the husband. It's the father. And, and again, we've gone way far away from this. But God has given the man the authority in the household to say, you know what? I can hear a vow that my wife can make unto God. And I can say, no. That vow is not going to say, you cannot make that vow. God has made the man the spiritual leader in the household, and God has given us that power to even, this is, and this is interesting because this is a, a situation where, you know, we all have personal relationships with God. We all have that, that where you pray to God, and it's a very personal thing, it's a very individual thing that you have with God. This is one area where God has, has, has mixed, where he says the man actually has some control over you, even your personal relationship in a sense that you can't make a vow unto God unless it's, unless it's basically approved by the husband or by the father. And this is important for us to remember that because the husband or the father has that authority in the house. So it, it's just, it just goes with the role that God has given us. Look at verse number nine. It says, but every vow of a widow and of her that is divorced, wherewith she hath bound her, their souls, shall stand against her. So if they don't have a father, if they don't have a husband, and they make that vow, you know, if they're not living at home and have the father, you know, where they're living under the, in the same house as their father, or if they're, um, you know, living alone and they're, they're divorced or whatever, they're a widow, then that stands. Because they're, they're, they don't have that other authority figure in the house. It says, and if she vowed in her husband's house or bound her soul by a bond with an oath, verse 11, and her husband heard it and held his peace at her and disallowed her not, then all her vows shall stand, and every bond wherewith she bound her soul shall stand, verse 12. But if her husband had utterly made them void on the day he heard them, then whatsoever proceeded out of her lips concerning her vows or concerning the bond of her soul shall not stand. Her husband hath made them void, and the Lord shall forgive her. Every vow and every binding oath to afflict the soul, her husband may establish it, or her husband may make it void. But if her husband altogether hold his peace at her from day to day, then he establisheth all her vows, or all her bonds which are upon her, he confirmeth them, because he held his peace at her in the day that he heard them. Now, husbands, be careful about this too, because if you hear something, it says, you don't have to just say, no, that's not allowed, or you do have to say that. No, you do have to say, no, that's not allowed. If you hold your peace, if you just don't say anything at all, that is viewed as acceptance. That's right. So keep that in mind because if you don't like it, if you don't think that she should make it about, you have to speak up and say something about it or else that vow is going to stand. You can't just sit there and not say anything and be like, well, I don't really like that she made this vow and I don't think she should have made this vow and just sit there and think that inside, inside your head and then just never say anything about it. No, God says you need to be a man. You need to just say, no, this is the way it is. You can't make that vow or, you know, you can either hold your peace or just say, yeah, that's, that sounds like a good vow. Okay, that, you know, that's, you prove of it. But when you hold your peace and you know what, this is the way it is in general. Okay, not even just with making vows. When you hold your peace, that's always viewed as, as acceptance. When so, if someone comes up to you and just says something, if they just say something filthy, they're like, well, you know what I believe? I think that, that, um, that it's fine. I mean, the sodomy is fine. It's no big deal. And when you just sit there, you just don't say anything, you're viewed as being in, in agreement with what they just said. You're just, it's just... And, and that's what happened. And this is why, one of the reasons why... Our society gets so wicked and, and things have gone so bad is because good men say nothing. Yeah. Nobody stands up. No one says the truth. No one's going to stand up and say, no, that's wrong. No, that's wickedness. We need as Christians to be able to do that, especially as men. It starts in the house and it proceeds from there. Right. And it says in verse 16, these are the statutes which the Lord commanded Moses between a man and his wife, between the father and his daughter, being yet in her youth in her father's house. Now, what I said was, you know, there's a lot of things that happen we have, we have oaths, we have, we have traditions, we have things that get passed on and you don't understand why. 
This totally explains why when you have a wedding, when you have the wedding ceremony, when the father gives away the daughter to become the wife of the husband, because that father, before she gets married, hey, they're making a vow. The father has the authority to disallow a vow that his daughter is going to make. I don't care if, if, if the daughter loves this man and the man loves the woman and they want to go get married. If the, if the father hears that vow, he can say no. God has given him that authority. And that's why in the past it used to be that the man that wants to marry a woman would go to the father and get permission and seek to get his blessing and would go and look for that because it was the father's ultimate authority that would say yes or no. You are not allowed to do this. And I'll tell you what, I don't care if people look at us funny. I don't care if it's old-fashioned. But my daughters are not going to be able to marry a man that I disallow. They will not be allowed to make that vow. That is something I will say no. And it's in the Bible, and it's very clear. I don't think there's any other way of interpreting this passage other than the fact that God has given the husband or the father the authority to disallow vows. And there is no greater vow that, that we really have today than the vow of marriage. And, and if, the, if the father does not the, disallows that vow, that vow is disallowed. Now, as long as we're on the subject of marriage, talk about a vow. Talk about a vow that people are breaking today. When you say something, when you make an oath, when you make a promise, when you say, I'm going to be with you until we die for better, for worse, no matter what happens, I'm going to be married to you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. Hey, you better follow that vow. You better pay reverence and respect to the fact that you vowed before God and before man and made a promise that I will stay with you until one of us dies. That vow is forever. God hates lying. The Bible says that God hates putting away in the book of Malachi, chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Yet ye say, Wherefore? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. It's a covenant that you make with your wife. It's a promise. It's an oath. It's before God. It's before man. It says, And did he not make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one? That he might seek a goodly seed, Therefore take heed to your spirit, let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. And putting in the way of the Bible is another word for divorce. When you put your wife away, you divorce your wife. The Bible says that the Lord, he hateth putting away. It says, for one covereth violence with his garment, said the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. Hey man, you want to divorce your wife? You're dealing treacherously with her. You are breaking a vow you made to God. You're breaking the vow you made to your wife. And do you think that's just the Old Testament? No way. My, the Bible says, Jesus Christ even says, it says in, in Matthew 5, 31, it says, It has been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. He said, look, if you're to divorce your wife, you're, just, you're causing her to commit adultery. And newsflash here, look, he has, there's one caveat in the law. It says saving for the cause of fornication. Right? That's it. That's the one thing ever in the entire Bible that God ever says would be a case where it would be okay for a man to divorce his wife or a, wife, you know, a woman to divorce her husband. But I, let me tell you something. That word fornication, it doesn't say in the case of adultery. Okay, fornication is something that happens between a man and woman prior to marriage. That's something that happens. And, and I, once you consummate that marriage, once you come together and you become one flesh, what God hath joined together, let not man divide asunder, the Bible says. When, when that marriage is fulfilled. See, oftentimes, in older days, people would espouse themselves, but the marriage isn't consummated yet. And this is why it said that Joseph was a just man. When he found out that Mary was with child, it would have been okay for him to divorce her, thinking that, hey, she's committed fornication. 
Because how else would she be <laughs> pregnant, right? Yeah. This is the one case yeah. where, where that's, not, that's not true. But any other case, right? You find out, man, you're a spouse of this woman, and you haven't consummated the marriage yet, and then it's like, oh, she's pregnant. That is the one case where God says it would be okay to do it. Now, he made it okay for the hardness of our hearts. Bob says, but from the beginning it was not so. Sure. God does not, still does not want you to get divorced. He says that is the only case where it would be allowed. But it's still not what he wants. It's still, I do not believe it would still be in his will for you to divorce. If you, when you decide that you're, you, know, you marry your wife, hey, when, when, especially when God's joined you together, let not man divide asunder. <clears throat> The Bible says in James 5, we're almost done, James 5, 12 says, But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. He's just saying, look, don't make these oaths. Swear not at all. Don't swear by God. Don't swear by heaven. He says, neither by any other oath. He just says, look, what you say, just let that be true. Let your yay be yay when you say something, it's true. Or let your nay be nay when you say no, and just let that stand. He says, otherwise you fall into condemnation. The condemnation being when you break your promise, when you, when you make an oath and, you, and you, don't, you don't follow through with it. Now you're falling into condemnation. Now you're in sin because you're not doing what you said that you're going to do. The Bible says in Matthew 5.33, it says, Again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black, but let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these, cometh of evil. <clears throat> no matter what you say, anything that you speak ought to be true. You should be known as being someone who's dependable, someone who's reliable, someone who could be trusted based on the words that you speak. Whether you're making a vow to stay with someone forever, a marriage vow, if you're doing something like that, or even if you're just telling someone, how about this? Hey, I'm going to pray for you. You hear that all the time. But I bet, I know there's got to be a lot of people out there that say with their lips that they're going to do something and then they don't follow through and do it. It's a good thing to say. People like to hear that and you like to hear that because you want people to pray for you. Obviously, yeah. praying is a great thing. Hey, I love it when people say, hey, we're praying for your church. We're praying for your family. Thank you. I'll take all the prayers we can get because I know that God is faithful and true and he's going to hear those prayers and that he'll answer them. And, and I know that people have been praying for us just based on the blessing that we've had in our own life. But don't say that you're going to pray for somebody if you're not going to follow through and do it. That's right. Usually when I say that, and I'll say that to people sometimes out at the door, and you know what I do? Because I don't want to forget by the time I get home, I'll say a prayer right away for them. If I say, if some, if I come across someone and they're they're in a bad shape, maybe they have cancer, maybe there's something else going on, and I'll say, you know what? I'll, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. Uh, if I don't pray with them right there, as soon as I leave that door, I'll try to I'll make it a point because I don't want to be a liar. Right. I don't want to say something and then not follow through and do it. So I'll just I'll either silently pray, I'll pray to God. If I'm done with that door, I'll just take a minute and just make sure that I pray for them. Now, it would be good, you know, I try to, to remember later on and try to add them to prayer lists and things like that. But, but look, when you say something, follow through and do it. Don't, don't just throw around words lightly, especially the words like that, because people like to hear that. Don't just say it because it sounds good to say or hear other people saying it. Yeah. Stay true to your word. We're going to close with this. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. You can turn there if you like. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter number 1, in verse number 17, the Bible reads, When I therefore was thus minded, did I use lightness? Or the things that I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh, that with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay? Verse number 18, 
But as God is true, our word toward you was not yea and nay. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. He says, look, when I came unto you, it wasn't yes and no, it wasn't, you know, he said, no. In him it's yea. In God it's yea. God's word is true. Right. We know that Jesus Christ came. We know that he paid for our sins. And salvation through him, you know, it says, but as God is true, our word toward you is not yea and nay. So just as God is true, your word should be true also. Uh -huh. And it's something that we need to pay attention to. It's something in this society, it's easy to fall into this sin. It's easy to be a part of this, yeah. this, this lying mentality. You just say things and you don't really mean them. And you say things and you don't follow through them. Don't let that be you. When you go out of here today, just in your day, because this is, I mean, this is, this affects your daily life. This is something that you deal with on a daily basis. Careful of the words that come out of your mouth. You don't want to be found a liar when you make a vow, when you make a promise. It's, I'll tell you what, it's safer not to make a vow at all. That's right. That's the safe way. If you want to be safe, if you want to make sure, hey, I don't want to say something that, that, that's, that I'm not going to follow through with, then just don't. Don't make the vow. Don't make those oaths. That's the wisdom that's being told us. Hey, look, because you don't have, we're not commanded to make these vows. This isn't something that's required of you to do. It's something that you do. That's why you like it. It's a free will offering. It's something that you're offering up to God. And hey, if you want to do it, great. But make sure that you follow through with it. Because not following through is going to be worse than just never, make, never making that vow to begin with. And I understand the making the vows of God because you love him, you appreciate him, you just want to show that you're dedicating yourself to him. Hey, I'm going to serve you, I want to do this, God, and, and you want to make sure that you're serious with him. So you make those vows, but just be careful with it. Take heed to yourself. Make sure that you know the cost before you open up your mouth. Make sure that you will be able to do it because if you don't, it's a sin. Let's bow right to have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the Bible. God, I pray that you would please help us all to walk uprightly. Help us to be known, especially as Christians, that, that people are going to be looking at us through a microscope. Dear God, they're going to be looking at us, trying to find fault with us. Dear Lord, I pray that this would not be one of our faults. That when we say something to our boss at work, when we say something to, to, to Corey, when we say to just something to people in our family or just in other people we come in contact with, that when we say something to them, dear Lord, that we would follow through and do it, that we would be known to be men of our word and, um, and to treat it as important, that we wouldn't just go around saying things that, that we don't really mean or um, that won't come to pass. And God, I pray that you would please just help us to understand the gravity of vows that we make, especially when we make them to you. And when we swear by your name, dear Lord, I pray that you would please just, just help us all to think before we speak. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.